Hey, welcome to Sleuths R Us. How can I help you? Got a dead body? Interesting. Sounds like a case for detective me. It is so nice to have you here today. We are attempting to solve a mystery. I just got done filming like a vampire Halloween book video. So I still have like the vampire half look going on, but that's kind of perfect because this is an Agatha Christie murder mystery video where I'm going to attempt to solve one of her mystery novels. Okay, so here is what is up. Essentially this whole wall, my plan is to fill it with like my crazy like detective corkboard whiteboard thing. I actually today ordered a huge whiteboard. I wanted to get one of the ones on wheels, but they were like very expensive. And I was like, am I gonna make this money back in the AdSense? I guess we'll find out. So this, where these sticky notes are, this is all gonna be filled. And then the whiteboard is gonna get here in a little while. But this video, we're going to attempt to solve the Agatha Christie murder mystery, find out who done it. And the one I picked is the murder of Roger Ackroyd. So I'm very excited for this one. I've read, I think this is gonna be my fourth or fifth Agatha Christie novel. I don't think I've ever really solved them, but then again, I honestly haven't really ever tried. I just kind of listen to them and be like, da, 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 da. So I have the audiobook for this in. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to start cracking on with this mystery. So we're gonna fill up this wall with absolutely everything and we're gonna try to solve it together. I'm definitely gonna stop at a certain point and like give you my last firm guess. And like, that's quite easy to do. And Agatha Christie novels, thankfully, because she has a point, at least in the Poro ones where he goes, okay, now I'm gonna tell you everything I know. And like, it's very clear. He's about to spill all the beans. So you can like stop and like give it your best, your best answer. So that's what we're gonna do. The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie, performed by Hugh Fraser. Chapter one. Dr. Shepard at the breakfast table. Mrs. Ferris died on the night of the 16th, 17th century. Oh my god, we're into it. Wait. Oh my god, what if they already said something? That's a clue. Oh my god, stop talking. Wait, I'm not listening. This is going to be hard. Over here is going to be for Mrs. Ferris. Okay, so we have a Mrs. Ferris and she's hella dead. I was sent for a headcloth on the morning of Friday the 17th. There was nothing to be done. She had been dead some hours. Okay, so, so far we're following a protagonist named James. Poro isn't even on the scene yet, but we have a woman named Mrs. Farrows. She's big time dead. She bit the bullet, she's dead. But James also has a sister named Caroline and Caroline is a notorious gossip, but she doesn't leave her home. Like she gets all of her information and all of her little juicy secrets from like the servants of the house, the milkman, the fruit seller, like random people coming to tell her stuff. We don't know how she manages this. But James doesn't want to tell Caroline about Mrs. Farrow's death. They think it's just a death because then she'll blab about it to the rest of the town. Okay, wow, these books move fast. So essentially, Mrs. Farrow's, the woman who died, is a widow and her husband died about a year ago from the time that she just died on these nights of September. Um, her husband died of acute gastritis, apparently, but Caroline, James's sister, thinks that Mrs. Farrow's poisoned her husband because the symptoms of arsenic poisoning and acute gastritis are quite similar. Caroline already knew that Mrs. Farrow's was dead by the time James comes in to tell her, and she says that Annie, the maid, told her that Mrs. Farrow's died. Um, and James is like, well, she died of an overdose on her sleeping pills, and Caroline is like, no, she committed suicide. So there's already <laughs> these Agatha Christie books pack so much in and I'm only five and a half minutes through the audiobook so wow I think this whole wall is absolutely going to be filled with stuff oh hello Agatha Christie here Agatha and I, my good friend Agatha, wherever you may be, would also like to take a few minutes to thank the sponsor of today's video because it is the perfect match since this video is sponsored by Hunt a Killer, which is a monthly murder mystery game experience. Hunt a Killer has partnered both with the Agatha Christie estate, the Agatha Christie estate, as well as HarperCollins to bring something together that is truly magical and that is an all-in-one premium Agatha Christie murder mystery box. Here it is. Oh, 
It is based on one of her short stories called The Mystery of Hunter's Lodge. So this is a collector's edition and Hunter Killer, the company, does specialize in creating these games that are very different from board games. It's kind of like bringing almost an escape room into your house. Comes with so many different things inside to help you solve the mystery of what happened to millionaire Harrington Pace, who was found murdered in his bed. And because Hercule Poirot is down and out with influenza, it is now our turn to partner with Arthur Hastings and solve what happened to this rich old man. I played this at a Halloween party with two of my best friends and we like lost it. We lost ourselves in it. The three of us absolutely love and crave and adore stuff like this. It was honestly the best experience ever. I think it took us like four hours. Might be because other things were also involved. And we actually did end up solving the murder, the mystery we did it the designers who crafted the items in the box whether that's like the autopsy report the witness statements clues that come with it burned ripped up letters or even this like watch i 100 did steal the watch out of the box when i was done with it if you are interested to maybe have a day a friend night a halloween party or a christmas party i think this would be perfect for christmas this box is a pre-sale and they will be shipping out in december i will of course leave a link in the description box and you can use the code EMMY for $10 off your order if you are interested in solving an Agatha Christie thing. Thank you so much for sponsoring this video and let's see if I can go two for two and solve another Agatha Christie murder. All right, welcome back to the precinct. As you can see, we have some more detective notes. This story is actually getting very complicated. I was listening to it a little bit this morning while I had my coffee. So essentially we have met Roger Ackroyd who of course is the title of this book. He's 50 years old. He's a manufacturer of wagon wheels. That was his first mistake. And he is the life and soul of the small village that this book takes place in called King's Abbot. He's like the life and soul of this place where everyone's main activity is just gossip because it's this very small town with not a lot to do. When he was 21 years old, he married a woman who was five or six years older than him. Um, she was an alcoholic and she died. He is also, I guess, the adoptive father of a son who is now 25 years old named Ralph. And Ralph is like a Greek god, like everyone falls in love with him. Roger Ackroyd is not dead right now. We actually just met Poirot, which I love. He is our protagonist neighbor. Our protagonist is Dr. Shepard. And then there's this like weird man in the garden next to the doctor's house and he's like throwing vegetables around and it ends up being Poro because his new hobby is like getting vegetable marrows. What else can I tell you? Roger Ackroyd has two like housemaids. One is Miss Russell who is um, kind of the leader and then he also has in his house Miss Cecil who is the widow of his brother, like of Roger's brother. So that is interesting. And it's like to her advantage that he remains unmarried. But we just learned that Mrs. Farrow's, who's the dead woman and Roger were quite close. And Mrs. Farrow's was last seen, the doctor last saw her on the day before she died, talking to Ralph, Roger's son. I've solved it. I've cracked it wide open. We just learned something. So hear, hear me out on this one. Ralph has a cousin, but they're not really related because Roger isn't really his like actual dad. It's just his like adoptive father from his marriage. So Ralph has a cousin named Flora and apparently they're gonna get married. Poirot told us that apparently Ackroyd is quite happy and a little bit pushy at the match between them. Well, Caroline told us that Ackroyd doesn't want it and Ackroyd is like thinking his son is in London when in reality he is in the town, but she overheard Ralph in the woods talking to a girl who doesn't seem to be Flora saying that he is going to get rich when Roger dies because he'll get all of Roger's money being his like son. We have no idea who this woman is. I think the woman is Mrs. Farrow's. I think she's somehow alive. I'm just going to start making the most outlandish guesses and see. It was just a few minutes before half past seven when I rang the front doorbell of Fernley Park to come on foot. Okay. I stepped into the big square hall and Parker relieved me of my overcoat. The last was an allusion to my black bag, which I had laid down on the oak chest. He's dead. <laughs> He's so dead. Roger Ackroyd is so dead right now. There's no way this man brought his doctor's bag just for someone not to die. Quite subconsciously, I wondered whether she had been out. She was breathing hard, as though she had been running. I'm afraid I'm a few minutes early, I said. Seems kind of sus. It's gone half past seven, Dr. Shepard. Half past seven. Okay, so let's make like a dinner party. Uh, 
place on the wall. I love dinner parties, especially when they end in murder. Mm. Okay, he's not dead. He's sitting down to eat dinner. Okay, so actually Roger Ackroyd just died, like still on the night of the dinner party, okay? But uh, our doctor Shepard goes home after Roger has just gotten a letter from Mrs. Farrow's and apparently like they were gonna get married. Um, but then she told him that she did in fact poison her late husband and Roger being like a decent man, I guess, was like, oh my gosh, no way. But then she sent him a letter of someone who had been blackmailing her for like a year because they knew that she murdered her husband. Um, but we, the reader doesn't know, apparently Roger knows. But then Dr. Shepard just got a call as soon as he gets back home being like, Roger is dead, like he's been murdered. And so he rushes back there and that's where I am now. But I'm like, oh my gosh, now we have two murders. The plot thickens. Now I have to solve this case because I got a whiteboard. This whiteboard will be the source of my power. Bruh. Okay. I got it. I got it. All right. I'm gonna solve this one. All right, hey, so. I have my whiteboard here that I got. I don't think I want to fully commit to hanging it to the wall. So I've been listening to Roger Ackroyd a lot and I have a little deck of clues here because Roger Ackroyd is hella dead now. He's gone, he's on the floor. And so I need to translate these clues and make them like coherent onto my big board of blues clues. Okay, so we're gonna call this clues. First up, we're gonna start with the timeline of events. All right, so this is the timeline. So basically, our protagonist was talking with Roger, leaves Roger's house at 8.50. 9 p.m., Roger's son, Ralph, leaves the inn where he was staying at. 9.25, the housekeeper at Roger's house sees Ralph, his son, on the terrace outside. 9.30, Raymond, the secretary, heard Roger in his study speaking to someone. And then 9.45, Flora goes up to see her uncle and Roger asks her not to be disturbed, please but the butler goes and disturbs him anyway, which is another thing. And then 10.15, Dr. Shepard gets the call that there's trouble from like an anonymous person, probably from like the train station, um, because the next train leaves at 10.23. And then when they find Roger, he's been dead for 30 minutes. So now we need to actually talk about the body, um, the artifacts, the people and stuff like that. Okay, so we have a lot of clues. So to recap, or just to tell you, <laughs> um, this whole video is gonna have spoilers for the murder of Roger Ackroyd, obviously. Roger was stabbed in the back <laughs> with a very sharp antique dagger that his friend, Major Blunt, gave him. And what really kind of concerned me was this one phrase that they used because the dagger was so sharp that they said a child could do it a child could murder him because it's just so incredibly sharp. So that was a little bit sus. And so the dagger is usually kept in a silver box in the drawing room. When Shepard gets there, he hears the silver box being opened. The housekeeper says that she closed the box. She's not sure if the dagger was in there at the beginning of the night, at the beginning of the dinner party when she closed it. Flora, Roger's niece, thinks that it was gone 
because she went in the silver box too for some reason. Flora's acting really sus. The room itself, the door was locked from the inside. Dr. Shepard, our protagonist, had bolted the window before he left Roger for the night, but they found it open, which means that Roger probably opened it himself. And because the fire was burning low, that means that the room was not hot, not stuffy. There was no reason to let in a breeze. It was probably very comfortable. And so they think that Roger opened it to let someone in. And if you open a door to let someone in, you're probably letting in someone you know. Spooky. Something that Poirot, because Poirot is on the scene now, he's been fully employed by Flora. Um, he thought it was really weird that the armchair was weirdly like taken out from the wall and facing the door of the study. Um, and was clearly moved from its rightful place. And then later when they go back to the room, the chair was moved back into place, but no one has confessed to moving the chair back. So he's like super fixated on this armchair, which is interesting. Um, Roger got a blue envelope from the woman he was seeing, basically saying, please catch my blackmailer. That blue envelope is completely missing. It was stolen. Outside were found footprints, also on the window pane, um, from shoes with rubber soles. And police did find a pair of shoes with rubber soles outside. So someone could have easily put them on, done the crime, discarded them and left in their own shoes, I guess. And then the last kind of clue we have is that a piece of a white handkerchief, like a little piece of the fabric and also a quill pen were found outside Roger's summer house, like on the property. Um, and they seem to be left there quite recently. So curiouser and curiouser. Flora right now is acting most suspicious um, because she was just literally seen flirting with Major Blunt, who is Roger's friend, her uncle's friend. And she also confessed to him that she now has freedom because her uncle is dead. She doesn't really have to marry Ralph anymore. And she also was left 20,000 pounds in his will. And she's like, oh my gosh, I have freedom. And then she's just out here flirting with Blunt. And I'm like, hmm. Everyone is kind of acting suspicious. The other thing that I'm currently thinking right now is some weird thoughts about Shepard's sister, Carolyn, who we said is the notorious gossip and she just stays home. I think she might have a bigger part to play in this because why do I think this? I think she could have easily blackmailed the woman and also it was a little bit strange that like when roger was sitting down with shepherd he read him the entire letter um about the blackmail but he like literally stopped right before he said the blackmailer's name and i'm like if you open a letter and you're super comfortable telling someone the whole entire contents within it like talking about the blackmail that no one else knows about and you stop before you say their name it's clearly because you are worried about the other person's reaction and i'm thinking why he's probably worried about Shepard's reaction is that it's someone he's either close to or that he knows deeply and the only person I can think of is his sister. Just a theory. The conspiracy continues. All right, another day at the precinct. Welcome back. I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue what's happening. So we're gonna do a little recap, I think. I have some new clues to add to the board. Right now I have a suspicion that Mrs. Farrows, remember she was the lady who died at the start of the book. I'm just not fully convinced that she's actually dead. Flora also got 20,000 pounds left to her in Roger's will, which she said was freedom. Um, but Flora's mother is quite upset that she got that much money. We're gonna make a category just for money right now. Roger Ackroyd kept all of his money in his room in a box in his room. And the night before he died, he put a hundred pounds in a box. That was like to pay out for his servants and stuff. And so they go investigate the box and they find only 60 pounds in it. 40 pounds is out there floating somewhere. We don't know where. So the conclusion of that is he either paid it out, he either paid out 40 bucks before he died or someone stole it. Maybe whoever he was talking to in his room at night that people heard him talking to right before he was found dead, like maybe he gave that person 40 pounds. The only person in Roger's room would have been the housemaid as well. The parlor maid, who is a girl named Ursuline, I believe she's leaving. She she's quitting. The reason that Ursuline is leaving is because she like messed up some papers on Roger's desk and he got mad at her and he's like, get out. But Raymond, the secretary was like, there were no important papers on Roger's desk. So Sus. Then we find out that she was actually probably lying because Mrs. Aykroyd on Friday afternoon went into Roger's study to find his will to make sure that like she was in it and the parlor maid Ursuline came in and caught her and then Ursuline talked to Roger after probably about his sister-in-law and Mrs. Aykroyd was actually the one who opened the silver box. 
that contained the dagger. So now we know who opened it in the first place, but she said she opened it because she wanted to value some antique inside to let Roger know how much it was worth. Girl. Everyone, everyone, absolutely everyone is just so suspicious right now, but as well the secretary Raymond confessed to Poirot that he was in debt and that the 500 legacy that Roger left him in his will was a relief. But both Raymond and Blunt, who was Roger's friend, they have an alibi because they were in the billiards room together around the time the murder is supposed to have happened. Also, Blunt is the only one in the house who like doesn't stand to gain anything by his friend's death, really, that we know of. Also, the fact that Ursuline asked if the murder could have occurred earlier because Ackroyd is supposed to have been stabbed between 9.45 and 10, but the parlor maid is like, could that have been earlier? And I'm like, why? What did you see? Maybe the voice that people heard because Raymond heard Roger speaking in his room. Maybe it was like someone else's voice in the room impersonating him. I am more than halfway through the audiobook and kind of what I'm really hoping is that Agatha Christie doesn't like kind of leave out anything that like we would need to solve it because Poro keeps being like, oh, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm thinking. I'm not gonna tell you that. So I just hope like I can realistically solve it. Sit there like a deadhead, say nothing at all. But my dear, I have really nothing to say. That is, of the kind you mean. Okay, so at this game of cards, Shepard tells him about a ring that Poro finds in the pond at Roger's mansion. Um, and it's a woman's wedding ring inscribed with from R, March 13th. Oh wait, maybe it's not even Mrs. Farrow's ring. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Six months ago. <gasps> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> 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 Never mind. That of Colonel Carter, that Ralph was secretly married to Flora. That the first, almost simple solution. Two, that of Miss Gannett, that Roger Ackroyd had been secretly married to Mrs. Ferrers. Okay, this case is haunting me, but we have some progress because we've learned some more information and I have a few theories, so I'm gonna sound them out with you. So first of all, just to really quickly run you through the few basic points that we've learned since last time. We learned that the butler wasn't aware of the blackmail. I might have already said this. Um, that Mrs. Farrows was going through, Parker did not know that she was being blackmailed. Um, so he wasn't trying to get anything out of it. Um, we have the possibility that Roger Ackroyd may have burned Mrs. Farrow's letter himself before he was murdered, like in his office fire. Um, we know that only Ralph and Flora don't have sound alibis for the 9.45 to 10 p.m. time that Roger was supposed to be murdered. Right? And Poirot makes the very acute observation that Parker the butler only said that he saw Flora like with her hand on her uncle's door, not necessarily coming out of Roger's study. So when Flora is pressed, she actually admits that she was not in his study at all. She never spoke to her uncle that night. She didn't even see him. She was actually upstairs in his bedroom stealing the money that was missing, the 40 pounds that was gone from Roger's 100 pound stash in his room. She was up there stealing it. And when she heard Parker with his drinks, she like ran downstairs um, and then pretended to be coming out of his study. So now we know that she is a thief, probably not a murderer. I guess she has a pretty sound alibi, although um, she was the one who stole the money. So we know that. However, then we find out that Blunt, which we kind of already knew is in love with her. I think that was pretty clear, or at least maybe I didn't really make that clear, but he's in love with her and he tries to like say that, no, she didn't steal it. Like he gave it to me. Anyway, he's full of the most important thing now is that we have a new time to prove the innocence of people since um, Roger asked Flora not to be disturbed at 9.45. That was like our original thing. But now that we know Flora didn't even see him at 9.45, 9.30 is the new time since that is when the secretary heard Roger speaking in his office to someone. So 9.30 is the new special time. 9.30. We have a few things that I think are happening. And that's the thing with Agatha Christie books. Like there's always so much more to solve than just like the murder or even just a blackmail, but people's relationships with one another, people's feelings, people always have a million secrets in these books. So what I think is going on with a few of these people, we have Ralph, who we still don't know where he is, but we now know that Flora doesn't love Ralph. She was only marrying him to please her uncle and to get out of the tough financial situation that she and her mother have been living their lives in. So I'm thinking that Ralph, right? Cause Carolyn saw her, heard Ralph talking to a lady in the forest. I'm thinking Ralph and Ursuline, the parlor maid are together or 
love each other. It's just repeated so often how pretty and how amazing the parlor maid is, um, as well as repeating how great Ralph is and how handsome he is. I just feel like they are the couple. That's who he was talking to in the forest. I'm also thinking that Ursuline put in her notice of leaving her job because Flora and Ralph's engagement came out um, the day, was it the day or the day before his murder? And then that's when she puts in her application to resign. So I'm thinking she was upset about that. We know that at 9.45, we thought that Blunt and Raymond were in the billiards room, but now that we know it's 9.30, apparently Blunt was on the terrace at 9.30, which is strange. I also had a theory that maybe someone in the house tried to make it look as though um, someone from the outside committed the murder. So what I'm thinking is that like, they went in to Roger's office and whoever he was talking to at 9.30, the person asking him for money, I feel like maybe that's the person who murdered him as well. Okay, here's the theory. So they go in the office, sit down, ask him about it, whatever. They have the Tunisian dagger from the silver box. They st How do they stab him in the back? Maybe they're like, oh, it's hot in here. They go around his desk, open the window, turn around, stab him in the back. They crawl out, oh wait, yeah, yeah. They crawl out the window, they put on the boots that were found and then they make tracks making it look as though they walked up to the window, climbs in, puts the snow and whatever on the windowsill, leaves the window open. And then on their haste to run back out of the room, they trip over the armchair, hence why it is weirdly, you know, swished out from the wall. That's my theory. Cause I feel like whoever murdered him ran back out into the hall and that's why the armchair is adrift or like knocked over a little bit, kind of knocked out of place. Um, I'm not sure how heavy the armchair is, like how hard you have to run into a big ass armchair. Who would have murdered him? Why would they have murdered him? Why? Why? Tell me your secrets. We also still have the question of this like ring, the woman's wedding ring that said from our March 13th that was found thrown away in Roger's pond. I'm tending to believe that it's like from Roger given to Mrs. Farrow since it was six months ago. Um, and that might've been around the time she like refused him and said she had to wait until the year of mourning was up. I think I need to develop like exceedingly more crazy and outlandish theories because everyone keeps commenting on my reading vlogs that the murder of Roger Ackroyd has like the craziest ending and that I won't believe it and that it just blew them away. Maybe it's like a unicorn or something. Okay, also I kind of wanted to do a refresh on my theory that Mrs. Farrows is still alive because I'm thinking that like, they're just about to interview Mrs. Russell again, who is one of the housemates who's reigned the longest, but I'm thinking it's some like Romeo and Juliet thing where like they appear dead, but they're actually not. But then on the other hand, he is a doctor. So he should be able to tell whether someone is actually dead or just, you know, they've taken a drug that you know maybe makes their heart stop for a while or slow down or i don't know i don't know how things work this has kind of now put me back on suspecting carolyn um carolyn shepherd like our protagonist sister of either blackmailing and or murdering roger because she does admit at the start that she does think pharaohs killed her husband, which nobody knows until that blue envelope with the letter comes out. I think what I'm gonna do is go back to the start of the book and just listen to all of that. She's also one of the only people who of course doesn't have an alibi because we are never there at Shepard's house when things are going on. And of course he isn't either. So his sister could easily be out. And if she wanted to keep it secret that she was the blackmailer, it makes sense that I guess she would have murdered Roger, how she was supposed to have known that Mrs. Farrow's would have, if, if it was even Mrs. Farrow's that posted the letter saying that she was being blackmailed and here's the person and please get revenge for me. It just seems though that she, she is lying about certain things. She lied about being vegetarian. There's also that one part where Poirot asks her to identify the shoe color of Ralph Payton if his boots are brown or black. She says that they're one color when Poirot is like adamant they're the other color. So I feel like that was a test. I knew it. I knew it. Oh, that feels good. So it was Ursula and Ralph that are together. It just got revealed. Sleuth. I am a sleuth. First rate sleuth. So Ursula just showed up at Dr. Shepard's house and she's in the dining room crying. And then Poro comes in and Shepard's like, 
Ursula Bourne? Her name's Ursula. I think I've been calling her Ursuline. And then Poro is like, no, not Ursula Bourne. Ursula Payton. Also, Flora is now engaged to Major Blunt. That was very quick. A little over an hour left on the audiobook, so I know the part's gonna come up soon where Poro is definitely gonna be like, okay, here's what happened, let's solve it, and then I'll pause and give you my final, final guesses. Okay, we're getting quite close, I think, to the final revelation, but Poro just received Dr. Shepard's, like, diary of the case because Dr. Shepard's been writing everything down, like keeping track of everything that's been going on and he gives it to Poro to look through and Carolyn, for some reason, is quite upset at this and she's like, oh, I hope you haven't said anything, you know, untoward about me. Yeah, you do hope so. So I don't know, Poro is now gathering everyone together for a last little rendezvous and I think he's gonna reveal who did it, so I'm gonna stop I think at the next chapter when the meeting begins. Final guess, I think I'm now at that point, they're all sitting down and Toro did just say, I know everything, here it is. And I hit pause and I'm like, oh my God. I think Carolyn and Ralph were working together. I know Ralph and Ursula married, that's fine. They're great together, whatever. You know, I suspected her pretty early on, but I just don't know who else to turn to at this point. Mrs. Aykroyd, Flora's mom, is still pretty suspect as well. I don't, I don't know if I just didn't write down her alibi for the time of the murder, but I can't seem to find it now. And I honestly don't remember where she was. Um, and she also opened the dagger. No, no, opened the box with the dagger. Um, so that's a little sus as well. It's gotta be Carolyn. That's my only, that's my only answer right now. Carolyn or Mrs. Aykroyd, the murderer. Carolyn, the blackmailer for sure. Carolyn or Mrs. Aykroyd the murderer, Ralph, the willing accomplice. <gasps> okay, we're gonna find out, let's play it together. I should add as well that I think Carolyn knows exactly where Ralph is and she's either harboring him, knows where he is, and is keeping his whereabouts a secret. Everyone is here. There was a ring of satisfaction in his tone and with the sound of it, I saw a ripple of something like uneasiness pass over all those faces grouped at the other end of the room. Major Blunt, Mr. Jeffrey Raymond, Mrs. Ralph Payton, John Parker, Elizabeth Russell. I don't like it, she well. I don't like it. I, I would much prefer to go home. You cannot go home, madame, said Poirot sternly. So we come to another and most interesting aspect of the crime. Who was it in the room with Mr. Aykroyd at 9.30? Oh, I don't know. I didn't actually answer that. Who was in the room with Mr. Aykroyd at 9.30? Caroline? Mrs. Aykroyd? Caroline, Mrs. Aykroyd? And not Ralph Payton. Not Charles Kent. Was anyone with him? Poirot leaned forward. Oh. And you have all forgotten one thing, said Poirot softly. The stranger who called at the house the preceding Wednesday. They all stared at him. Who? But the dictaphone company. Gasped Raymond. I see it now. A dictaphone. That's what you think. Poirot nodded. Mr. Aykroyd had promised to invest in a dictaphone, you remember? Not now. This is the most random thing. He must have been on the hiding place of Ralph Payton. Where is it? Said Blunt sharply. Not very far away. <laughs> said Poirot, smiling. In Cranchester? I asked. No. Poirot turned to He is there. Dr. Shepard was a friend of Captain Payton's. Oh he... my. Oh, okay, wait. Are they actually going to do this? I just didn't suspect this because no Agatha Christie novel I've done before has done this. Where the narrator or Poro's assistant is involved in the crime. Okay, oh no, now it might be like Dr. Shepard and his sister. Oh, if it's the narrator, if it's the guy we've been following all along, I'm gonna be a little upset, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, so Dr. Shepard is the one who's been harboring Ralph in a nearby home for the mentally unstable of the area, I guess. What? Chapter 25. The whole truth. And Poro does say that the murderer is in the room and Carolyn is not in the room. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Okay, so I don't know how I was supposed to figure this out, but the dictaphone here, Roger had purchased one like the week before or something. And so the voice that everyone hears, like him saying, the demands of my purse have been quite frequent. It's not actually his voice, like his real voice. It's his voice pre-recorded coming out of the dictaphone that the murderer pressed. And the chair ended up being turned because it was hiding the table on which the dictaphone was so that the murderer could come in and take it afterwards. And no one would have known that Roger had even had a dictaphone in the first place. So they would have, has, so they would have assumed it was him actually talking and still alive at 9.30. Who had with him a receptacle suitable for hiding the dictaphone, such as a black bag and who had the study to himself for a few minutes after the crime oh was discovered God, while Parker was telephoning Shepherd. for the police. In fact, Dr. Shepard. There it is. See, 
I've been duped so hard and I don't think I like <laughs> to know that our narrator all along has been the murderer. I get why this is like her controversial mystery now. And maybe I should have suspected that given the fact that everyone was like, oh, it's so shocking, blah, blah, blah. It's cause I got lulled into the Agatha Christie, like innocent Poro's friend narrator motif, I think. I just want to know if Carolyn had anything to do with it because I suspected her so hard. So maybe I should have implicated Dr. Shepard when I implicated his sister, but I just thought she was the real villain and not him. Lock the study door on the inside, run back to the summer house, change back into your own shoes and race down to the gate. I, I also think that like, I would never have guessed it was him because like we're following his narrative and you never suspect that someone, you know, who is the narrator can lie so implicitly in their story since you're with him every single second. So it wouldn't make sense to me that like, like in the book, right? In the chapters, he says that he's with Roger and then Roger starts to read him his blue envelope. And then he stops reading and he's like, you know what, I have to go. And then Dr. Shepard, our narrator is like, okay, I'll see you later. And then he just describes himself leaving, him walking home, him getting home, him receiving a telephone call to bring him back. And then he finds the body. So to me, I would never have inserted like, a timeline in there or a change of event wherein Dr. Shepard was just completely lying about that whole thing. You think it's him just telling you? You don't know until about like 85 or 90 percent of the way through that like you're reading his journal, I guess, of the events. Safety. It was you who blackmailed Mrs. Ferris. Who, cool. looking back, I'm wondering if there was anything I'd left undone. All true, you see. But suppose I put a row of stars after the first sentence. Would somebody then have wondered what exactly happened in that blank 10 minutes? When I looked around the room from the door, I was quite satisfied. Oh, what? He put a row of stars? Bro, I'm listening to the audiobook. The narrator didn't say star, 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 star. But I wish Hercule Poirot had never retired from work and come here to grow vegetable melons. We hope you have enjoyed The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Yeah, Mr. you do. Called by Hugh Fraser. It? Wrong. Wrong on every front. Although to be fair, I don't know if anyone ever reading The Murder of Roger Ackroyd saw that coming because, like I said, how? How are you supposed to see that coming? Like you would 100% buy into the narrative that you're reading, that there's no like missing something in there that isn't, you know, supposed to be missing. It also makes me feel like all <laughs> this was for nothing because none of this is about Dr. Shepard. I can't believe, I can't believe I was on his sister's case the whole time and it was actually him. I don't know how I feel about it. I really don't know how I feel about that ending. We failed. The murderer would have gotten away with it too. This was still enjoyable though, although I don't know how I feel about the ending. I'm half cheesed, half like I should have included the narrator in my pool of suspects. Anyway, I'm gonna start erasing all this oh, in failure. All right, but thank you for joining me on our first ever trying to solve an Agatha Christie murder mystery book. Love to do one of these in the future. Love to check out other mystery writers as well. And I would love to find like an Agatha Christie book where I feel like you could actually guess the ending because I feel like that one was a bit um, more abstruse, if you will. Thank you to Hunt a Killer for sponsoring this video. Didn't help me hunt this killer, but really fun game. So until next time, I will see you super duper soon. Thanks so much for watching. Hey, did you just play Mission Fail? Can't believe this. Ciao.